boom, and we are back with Assassin's Creed uh, Discovery Tour. We finished off the Egypt one, as you can see. Uh, so now we're going to move on to Pyramids. Um, yeah. Let's see where this takes us. After Pyramids, Alexandria, Daily Life, and then Romans. But yeah, this is a great game for educational purposes. Um, again, it's definitely worth the pickup if you have Assassin's Creed Origins. Or if you don't have Assassin's Creed Origins, the game I didn't actually really like, but uh, this walkthrough, this uh, Discovery Tour thing is uh, pretty sweet. Definitely worth it in the long run. Or relative to. Sort of like the versus mode in uh, Call of Duty. Or um, online for um, StarCraft. Like, who really played the StarCraft storyline? Okay, here we go. Welcome to the Step Pyramid Complex of Djoser. Djoser. Hmm. So some of these are actually kind of boring, so I found that the pyramids one was kind of boring. If it gets too boring, I'll just skip over it. Like, it's not worth it. I mean, there's a limit The Step education. Pyramid is at the center of an enclosed complex, comprised of temples, models of palaces, and artificial constructions, all built for the afterlife of Pharaoh Djoser. Oh. The funeral complex itself covers 15 hectares and is located on the highest point of the Saqqara Plateau. It's clear from the elaborate detail and scale of the complex that this was a technological marvel of its time. Wow. The only fragment of information regarding the design plans of the complex was discovered on a section of stone containing an architectural sketch of a vault. That's pretty impressive, but it's pretty intense that they would go so far um, with relation to death. Let's the Step Pyramid is the first monument built of stone. Standing at 60 meters high, it was the tallest of its time. Hmm. Built 4,700 years ago, it was originally intended as a mastaba, which was a flat-roofed rectangular tomb. Its famous architect, Imhotep, oh, may have Imhotep. felt this was too humble for the great Pharaoh Djoser and began to add the steps. Imhotep. Is that like Moses? Time? The Step Pyramid Complex is enclosed within a 1,600 meter long wall that is 10 meters high. This large wall was made out of white limestone and oriented along the north-south axis. Hmm. That's kind of cool. While there are 14 doors, only its eastern door was intended to accommodate the living. The remaining false doors were built as portals for the king's car to pass through. Wow, Along with false doorways, the walls were designed with bastions and steeples resembling a defensive wall. The positioning of these design elements suggest that they were related to the Hebsed festival. Wow, look at this in relation to um, the city over there. And you have this crazy thing over here. That's pretty nuts. Still kept it around, it's not the middle of nowhere. The only real entrance into the complex is at the end of a long, narrow passageway. This enclosure has a stone canopy carved to resemble wooden logs. At the end of the passage is a large opening. Meant to resemble a doorway, it has carved doors and hinges that are permanently open and immovable. That's pretty sick. The corridor is lined with 20 pairs of columns up to six meters high, built by stacking stone drums. The completed facade was made to resemble reed stock bundles. Traces of red paint were found on the columns, along with black paint on the support walls. This would have had the effect of blending the walls into the shadows to give the red columns the illusion of standing on their own. Huh, that's cool. Well, look at this guard. It's pretty intense. Need to relax. Chambers are located on either side of the columns and are thought to be chapels representing the provinces of Upper and Lower Egypt. Hmm. According to some Egyptologists, the arrangement of the rooms may be symbolic of jurisdiction and judgment. That looks pretty sick. 
like Chichen Itza in Mexico. Guarded by a line of carved snakes, this tomb is located at the southern end of the courtyard. The burial chamber is beneath it, down a 30 meter deep shaft. The low ceiling chamber resembles a mastaba and is relatively intact compared to the later burial chamber. The tomb is made of pink granite, though there is evidence it was once polished limestone. Too small for a body, it is possible that the tomb was intended for the king's ka, or to hold the canopic jars containing the king's organs. Later traditions in burials would have the canopic jars in the same chamber as the body. So I'm not too sure if it was in this game or like I heard it somewhere else, but um, the snake, it's probably somewhere else, but the snake represents death. Um, and that's why it's around uh, Shiva's neck. Because it shows his like bravery or something. So like those are all just death symbols right there. It's crazy. A polished limestone staircase leads west from the tomb to underground apartments. Some of these rooms here? were intended to accommodate the king and his family in the afterlife. Oh. Many large jars of pottery were found, including some that still had deposits of beer, milk, and oil inside them. The false doorways are decorated with reliefs of the king taking part in rituals. In these reliefs, he is seen carrying agricultural tools, running, and performing a ritual for the reanimation of the deceased. Hmm. So he... nobody actually lived here. The architect Imhotep chose stone as a building material in order for the complex to last. Following the completion of the initial mastaba, Imhotep devised a burial of more ambitious dimensions. He set about stacking mastabas on top of each other. Evidence shows that the pyramid was enlarged twice by additional cuts into the steps. Eventually, mm -hmm. boring. a staircase allowing the pharaoh to enter the divine world was represented by a tiered pyramid, oblong in shape, completely enveloping the original mastaba. The pyramid itself is a solid structure. All of it's kind of boring as well. Pharaoh Djoser the Sacred was the founder of the Third Dynasty. He ruled for 19 years. During his reign, he was known as Horus Najeriket, divine of the body. He was given the name Djoser several centuries after his death as a sign of respect, and he is regarded as one of the greatest pharaohs of Egypt. An apocrypha was drafted in his name during... Mm. See, as I was saying... Djoser was associated kind of with the sky god Horus in his human form. A plinth near the step pyramid is inscribed with his name and associated with Horus. He was the first to reside in Memphis, making it the central hub of government for the region. Djoser was known to have built many temples and monuments before the complex at Saqqara. The funerary complex was the first of its kind and would mark Djoser's greatest architectural achievement. It's fascinating. Um, in, in Rome, um, the son of... Um, Son of Julius Caesar. What his name? Mm. Aug not Augustus. Mm. All right. Well, whatever his name was, uh, I'll remember it later. But he, uh, when Caesar was killed, what he ended up doing was saying that, telling everyone that Caesar was a god, and uh, well, Julius Caesar was a god, and then that ultimately made him the son of a god. It's kind of like this. It's like. In order to rule people, I need to create some sort of backstory, so I'm gonna say that I'm a descendant of Horus, or a reincarnation of Horus. But in the end of the day, it's just like people are people, man. Relax. The funerary complex was built to resemble Djoser's palace, with the stone carved to imitate mud brick, trees, and reeds. Creating these details and softer textures in hard stone would have been a time-consuming, labor-intensive task. I'm not an architecture guy. Much so of the complex is this. designed to accommodate the Hebsed festival, you are, allowing the uh, king the ability to affirm his rule even the in the afterlife. Yeah. Um, I'm more into like people psychology stuff, so I'm probably gonna breeze through this one really quick, unless there's a cool one that starts off. 
But if you uh, if you want to hear about it, you should definitely pick up the game. It's a good game. Jumping down. Here we go. In the corner is a temple referred to as T. This temple is among the most mysterious structures in the complex. Oh, why? Its outer facade is plain, while inside it is decorated with intricate jed pillars and carvings. It's possible that this place was intended to... Why? The Hebsed Festival enabled the Pharaoh to maintain universal order hmm. and renew godly powers. Oh, okay, that's fascinating. Through a series of trials and religious rites, such as dance, offerings, and visiting the sanctuaries of various deities, the ruler's vital force and divine nature was confirmed. The celebration was meant to represent the ruler's jubilee and would take place every 30 years, though the deadline was not always followed. The earliest known ritual dates from the first dynasty. Hmm. Getting in that spiritual healing. Within the complex of Djoser, southeast of the pyramid, is a dedicated space for this essential ritual to be performed by the king even in the afterlife. Oh my goodness, more afterlife The Hebsed stuff. courtyard is lined with false chapels and equipped with a platform featuring two staircases meant to represent Upper and Lower Egypt. It's all about that afterlife. It's crazy. There's so much fear surrounding it. Located in the courtyard, the two pavilions are believed to represent the palaces of Upper and Lower Egypt. Rectangular in shape, the two replica structures face one another. Their facade is similar to the chapels. The funerary temple is on the north side of the complex, facing the stars where the deceased ruler was believed to travel after okay. death. Within this temple was the pharaoh. The north wall has two observation holes. A statue of Djoser is seated on the throne, wearing a mantle and a tripartite wig with a crown known as a nemes. Representing the king's ka, this statue looks through the observation holes into the courtyard, hmm. enabling the king to observe the ceremonies and receive offerings in the afterlife. Wow. Okay, so what we learned is these people are obsessed with the afterlife, most likely because they're fearful of it, um, or it's a way to continue ruling power. Take your pick. But is an architecture one not the greatest? Hopefully that's not what all the pyramid ones are. That would kind of suck. Okay, inside Dozer Step Pyramid. Welcome to Inside Djoser's Step Pyramid. The architect of the Step Pyramid, Imhotep, was a man of great importance to Pharaoh Djoser and ancient Egyptians in general. The base of a statue of Djoser, discovered in 1926, celebrates Imhotep as a carpenter, sculptor, stonemaker, and chief of the seers. Little is known of Imhotep's day-to-day -day life, while he is credited for writing medical texts, it is for his role of architect that he is most famously known. Wow, Renaissance man, architect and medical doctor. From the design of the pyramid to the elements within the complex itself, Imhotep set out to create something that would immortalize his king. An architectural achievement, the step pyramid was made from stone blocks instead of mud brick. It was the first time Egyptians built a monument of that height. Imhotep explicitly intended for the stone to reflect natural materials. The funerary complex of Djoser remained famous throughout the centuries and millennia, and its great architect, Imhotep, was deified by ancient Egyptians during the late period. Makes sense. In addition to the central subterranean palace built for Djoser, 11 wells were dug. Each went to a depth of 33 meters and connected with a horizontal gallery extending for about 20 meters. The first five galleries were intended for members of the royal... It's boring. Two passages lead underground and branch off in three directions to various magazine galleries. This vast underground space 
accommodated sections for storage and ceremonial offerings. The burial chamber of Djoser is located at the bottom of a 28 meter deep central shaft. According to Egyptologist Jean-Philippe Lauer, the chamber was originally made from polished blocks of limestone, while its ceiling was decorated in five pointed stars. Hmm. At some point, however, the limestone blocks were replaced entirely by pink granite blocks, leaving behind only fragments of limestone blocks decorated with stars. Wait, what? Where, all right, so where is it? We're still making five-point stars. So where the heck is the next one? Oh my goodness. Did I just get lost? The guide is wrong. Look at this. Okay, fellas. Oh, there. At the foot of the chamber are many tunnels going in all directions. This maze of tunnels, galleries, oh, unlike the Great Pyramid of Giza or Menkara, the Pyramid of Djoser does not have any extra openings dug out by thieves. Hmm, special guy. The Pharaoh's apartments, also known as the Blue Chambers, are decorated with blue-green tiles meant to imitate the reed matting that covered the walls and windows of his palace. There are two long rooms running side by side along a north-south axis. The south room. So this is the boring. Um, the door frames are made of fine limestone Sorry, guys. and carved with the king's name. As in the south tomb, reliefs are carved into the doorways. These reliefs show the king performing rituals and visiting divine sanctuaries for all eternity. Okay, so obsession with death. That is what we are learning here today. Oh. Their interiors are fictive additions made by the team to add to the wonders of the tomb. It is clear from the elaborate detail and scale of the complex that this funerary monument was a technological marvel of its time. Yeah, I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. Let me just skip the rest of this, uh, this whole pyramid section. I mean, they're kind of cool if you like figuring out why stuff was built for what or like how it was built. Definitely go check it out, but it's not really for me. Welcome to Sneferu's First Pyramid. With the long reign of Sneferu, the first king of the fourth dynasty, the most brilliant and creative period began for the construction of funerary monuments in Egypt. Funer yep. While Sneferu's monument so started stuff. as a seven-stepped pyramid, it was later altered into an eight-stepped structure. Oh, no. The final phase of... The smooth dressing of the walls did not provide sufficient bonding, however, and the outer casing did not rest on sound foundations. As a result, as well as the smooth sides, oh, it was the first time a ceremonial pavement was built, leading from the valley to the temple of the pyramid. Another innovation was that of the funerary chamber, which was no longer at the bottom of a well, but rather above ground level. This change signaled the beginning of the three-bedroom system. Okay, so we learned that um, the architects of the pyramid are not that interesting. Let's see if there's anything... Yeah, I'm not a pyramid fan. You can go check that out if you want. Let's see. Ah, oh, here we go. Now we're getting cool stuff. The Greek pharaohs. We're jumping to Alexandria, everyone.
wonder how this would how this would feel in the desert, you know what I mean? Like it's probably like really hot for him. Here we go. Welcome to the Greek Pharaohs. were considered divine incarnations of the gods. As an avatar of the gods living on Earth, the pharaoh's role was to preserve fundamental values and universal harmony by removing chaos, easefet, and ensure that justice, mot, prevailed. Hmm. The pharaoh, by divine ancestry and through multiple offerings, was the bond that unites the world of men to the world of the gods and allows the maintenance of the cosmic order. It's interesting we don't believe in that stuff anymore, uh, aside from the Pope. The Ptolemaic dynasty reigned over Egypt from 305 BCE to 30 BCE. The dynasty was called the Ptolemies of the Lagids, in recognition of the founder of the dynasty, Ptolemy Lagos, a Greek general and close friend of Alexander the Great. While Macedonian, Ptolemy Lagos understood that to be accepted by the Egyptian people, he would have to adopt their traditions. Upon assuming the title of Pharaoh, he changed his name to Ptolemy the First Soter, meaning savior. Hmm. Interesting. Born in 356 BCE, Alexander the Great went through a hasty education in the affairs of the kingdom before integrating into the Macedonian army, where he quickly rose through the ranks. After his father's assassination in 336 BCE, which some believed was orchestrated by Alexander himself, oh, no. he became king of Macedonia. Oh. Ruler of a unified kingdom and leader of a large army, Alexander set his sights on conquest. Eager to reclaim the Greek cities of Asia Minor, he took on the Persian forces, earning victory after victory. Wow, go him. Ever victorious, Alexander the Great marched on, laying siege to city after city until he reached Egypt, where the Persians were defeated yet again. Viewed as a liberator by the Egyptian people, Alexander decided to become Pharaoh in due form. He traveled to Thebes to make a sacrifice to Apis, then went to the oasis of Siwa, where he was proclaimed son of Amun. Officially Pharaoh of Egypt, Alexander spent much of the winter there, and founded the city of Alexandria. Perhaps not coincidentally, being pharaoh allowed Alexander to spread propaganda to prepare further conquests. Oh, okay. He resumed his military campaigns in 331 BCE. It's so fascinating. It's, it's interesting when you um, look at like history and stuff, like you're not too sure at the time like who's real and who's fake because there's so much like, uh, like drama or stories behind them like Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, uh, who's that guy? Achilles was not real, but uh, yeah. So I always thought, I don't know if this is dumb, but I always thought Alexander was fake. On his deathbed in 323 BCE, Alexander the Great gifted the satrapy of Egypt to Ptolemy Lagos. Perfectly aware of the value of Egypt, Ptolemy ensured not only the stability of the country's borders, but also its economic and military development. Hmm. At the same time, he worked with the Egyptian elite to maintain the internal order of the country. By 305 BCE, Ptolemy, well-respected both in Egypt and in the Mediterranean, was at the head of the largest fleet of the Hellenistic world. Ptolemy officially took the title of Pharaoh of Egypt in January 304 BCE, on the anniversary of Alexander the Great's death. Military might and economic might. Has it really changed? Alexander died in Babylon in 323 BCE. His remains were placed first in a solid gold sarcophagus and then within another. The casket was carried in an ornate custom wagon, gilded and set with precious stones, and pulled by 64 mules crowned with gold. Wow. The funeral procession was diverted to a grandiose temple in Alexandria, 
built in the Conqueror's honor under the orders of Ptolemy the First. So that's pretty extravagant. Julius Caesar visited Alexander's tomb at the capture of Alexandria, and the Roman Emperor Augustus reportedly placed flowers there. However, though many powerful leaders claim to have visited it, the tomb's location has gone missing from history. Some accounts do state that the golden coffin was replaced by a glass sarcophagus, probably by Ptolemy X. It is also implied that Cleopatra may have plundered the tomb in a time of financial crisis. That's fascinating. Grave robbing. In order to keep your power. So yeah, Alexander the Great was a real person. Who knew? Who knew? Welcome to Cleopatra, Queen of Egypt. Ooh, fascinating. Here we go. Cleopatra VII Theophilipater ascended the throne in 51 BCE at the age of 18. Though her early attempts to maintain power were often challenged, she eventually prevailed and became the sole ruler of Egypt. Good According to Plutarch, she was the only Ptolemaic pharaoh to speak the Egyptian language. Her intelligence, coupled with a good education and a great political mind, allowed her to make the alliances necessary to maintain the independence of Egypt while Rome was becoming a Mediterranean empire. Wow, that's cool. It is important to understand that Cleopatra's knowledge of Egyptian language and keen understanding of the culture allowed her to make powerful ideological reference that resonated with ancient Egyptians. By associating herself with the goddess Isid, the Divine Mother, Great of Magic, and Repository of Divine Essence, Cleopatra firmly established herself as the protector of the two lands and legitimized her place on the throne. It's like a Daenerys. Daenerys Upon his born. death in 51 BCE, Ptolemy XII Aulus bequeathed his kingdom to his daughter and eldest son, Cleopatra VII and Ptolemy XIII. As was custom, the siblings were married. The new pharaoh huh. was 10 years old, his sister wife, 17. Weird. The early years of their reign were not easy. Between 50 and 48 BCE, droughts and floods aggravated Egypt's problems. General Achilles and the royal advisor Pothinos kept intervening in the young ruler's political decisions and eventually colluded to turn Ptolemy XIII against Cleopatra. By 48 BCE, Cleopatra was in exile. Wait, did she just say General Achilles? Achilles? Hmm. So, is he real? What's going on, guys? What's going on? During Cleopatra's exile, the Roman Empire was not without its own internal conflict. Caesar and Pompey were at war with one another, and after his defeat in 48 BCE, Pompey fled to Alexandria in the hope of finding refuge. This turned out to be an unwise decision. Listening to his advisors, Ptolemy XIII elected to have Pompey assassinated, oh, his head kept as a gift in the hopes of acquiring Caesar's favor. Oh, double rough. This gambit backfired. Instead of earning approval, the murder of a Roman greatly angered Caesar. <laughs> Cleopatra, aware of Caesar's anger against Ptolemy, for the murder of Pompey, decided to take advantage of the situation. She returned to Egypt in secret, hoping to establish an alliance with one of the most powerful men of the time. Outside of the legend, where she had herself smuggled into his quarters in a carpet, what exactly happened during that fateful meeting remains a mystery. Ooh. However, Caesar seemed to see a better ruler for Egypt in Cleopatra than in her young and too easily influenced brother. Invoking Ptolemy XII's will, Caesar attempted to mediate peace between the siblings. Mm -hmm. Ptolemy XIII was enraged by the turn of events. 
and his advisors were none too happy to see Cleopatra return. Urged on by General Achilles and Pothinos, the young pharaoh plotted against Caesar and Cleopatra, resulting in the siege of Alexandria in 47 BCE. It was in March 47 BCE that Caesar defeated Ptolemy XIII's forces. The young pharaoh drowned in the Nile after having fled the battlefield. With her opponents dead or powerless, Cleopatra married her other much younger brother, Ptolemy XIV, and finally claimed the throne of Egypt for good. The end of the Alexandrian War also cemented the romantic and political alliance between Cleopatra and Caesar. It's a little weird, this like inbreeding thing. But I get it, keep the power in the family, but it's still weird. In June of 47 BCE, Cleopatra gave birth to a son, whom she called Caesarian. Caesar did not accept the boy as his heir, choosing instead his nephew Octavian. That's the one, Octavian. Nonetheless, yeah. on his return to Rome, Caesar invited the queen and her brother husband to stay in the city. Her presence still drew much disapproval from the Senate. Always a strategist, Caesar left four legions in Egypt and a man he trusted to direct Egyptian affairs, giving him control of the wheat supplies essential to Rome. Cleopatra and her entourage remained in Rome until March 44 BCE, when Caesar was murdered. Ooh, rough life. I am pretty sure it was Octavian, who, the person before I was talking about. I couldn't remember the name. Yeah, he's the one who um, went under Caesar. Although they said nephew, but I think later Caesar just took him as his son. Something like that. But yeah, propaganda. Caesar's most faithful ally, Mark Antony, often visited the Queen of Egypt during his stay in Rome. Unlike most, he recognized the legitimacy of Caesarian, the natural son of Caesar. Antony knew he would need the riches of Egypt in order to fight Octavian and claim the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. Cleopatra, in return, saw a powerful ally. In the winter of 41 BCE, she arranged a sumptuous tour of Egypt by boat to show Antony the wealth of her country and the power she held as its ruler. Wow. That's a really romantic good. and political relationship followed. The Roman Senate was once again most displeased. To calm spirits in Rome, Antony married Octavia, sister of Octavian. <laughs> okay. It's weird I use like marriages to like solidify things. Fascinating. Despite his marriage to Octavia, Antony remained Cleopatra's lover, and she gave birth to their children. Wow. Okay. Cleopatra increased her kingdom's territory and started a political propaganda alongside her lover in Egypt and beyond. Uh -uh. She hoped to create a Ptolemaic federal empire with Alexandria at its center. Antony eventually repudiated his Roman wife for the Egyptian queen, much to the dismay of the Roman elite. However, while Mark Antony focused on Egypt, Octavian carefully gained military and political ascendancy over him in Rome. Makes sense. Octavian managed his own propaganda campaign and succeeded. The Roman people hated Mark Antony and Cleopatra. To avoid the censure still inherent in attacking a fellow Roman, Octavian simply declared war against Egypt. Wow, okay. Rome's power still reigned supreme. The powerful Egyptian fleet, led by Cleopatra as well as Mark Antony's forces, were defeated in 31 BCE in Actium. Octavian arrived in Egypt in 30 BCE to formalize his victory. Nice. The following events remain difficult to confirm due to the many versions and legends around them. It is believed that after hearing a rumor about Cleopatra's suicide, Mark Antony committed suicide himself. Well, it's like, um, he was brought to the queen Romeo as Juliet. he slowly passed away. Knowing that Octavian would have her chained and paraded through Rome in defeat, Cleopatra planned her own suicide. She most likely killed herself with arsenic, Though admittedly, the version where she uses an asp to deliver a fatal bite may be considered more dramatic. What happened to the body of Cleopatra is still a mystery. Ooh, fascinating. So we found the origin story, the origin, um, 
the inspiration for Romeo and Juliet. I would assume. I mean, it sounds just like Romeo and Juliet, so, yeah. Um, stories built upon stories. Timeless tragedies. Let's see, the Siege of Alexandria. That was pretty cool. I like that one. It's kind of weird that they, uh, they use, like, inbreeding, though. Wouldn't the kids be all, like, messed up? Just saying. How many kids did, did uh, Cleopatra even have? Yeah, that's crazy. Like, what? 75? Like, come on. Whoa, 20 minute one. This is intense. Okay. Welcome Whatever. to the Siege of Alexandria. Wait, what? Oh, I did these already? Oh, yeah, I did do these already. I'm, like, missing one, I guess. The one over here. That's where I ended off. Yeah, yeah, I remember this. All this stuff got burned. Yeah, if you're wondering what happened, just watch the, um, the, uh, first impression video, that's where I discuss them. That's where we did all these. I, uh, just decided to go back and, like, pursue these because, uh, it was so fascinating when I did the first impressions. I was like, you know what? Might as well immortalize this. Minus that pyramid zone. That was pretty messed up. That's where I got off on the first impressions because I got interested over there. The destruction of the Great Library may have been due to a number of fires over the ages. Its end was probably closer to the 4th century CE, when the Christian Emperor Theodosius I ordered the closure of all pagan temples. Hmm. While some documents survived after being moved away, it remains unclear just what knowledge may have been lost. Too bad. I heard also that pagan just meant that non-Christian, so there you go. Where there are accounts of Achilles being in control of the battle against Caesar, it appears that instead, Cleopatra's sister, siding with her brother, had him killed and put her ally Ganymedes in his place. Ganymedes proved a valuable tactician for the Egyptian side. It was his idea to cut Caesar's access to the harbor, thus trapping Caesar at the palace. Sick, look at this. These uh, kids are wrestling. The grip fighting. That's awesome. But uh, yeah, so Achilles is real. What's going on? So... I guess there is no fake heroes. During the time of Ptolemy I, canals had been dug throughout Alexandria to provide fresh water. Ganymedes had his men take control of these canals. After isolating their own water supply, he had his men pour salt water into the canals and cisterns that led to Caesar's camp. Rude. Panic erupted in Caesar's men they wouldn't last long without fresh water. Recognizing that the porous limestone could help them, Caesar and his men dug wells to restore their water supply. Days later, the 37th Legion, comprised of Pompey's soldiers, arrived by ship. Unable to come ashore due to the winds, Caesar risked going out to meet them on the peninsula, Cape Chersonese. When the enemy learned Caesar's location, they rushed to intercept. Despite an obvious advantage for the Alexandrians, Caesar, with a Rhodian ship full of skillful sailors, emerged victorious. With help from the Allied ships, Caesar's victory enabled him to push the Egyptians back and secure the lighthouse. Gaining control of Ferris Island sent the Alexandrians into the sea and swimming back to the city. However, Caesar's fortification of the island didn't last long the enemy regrouped and were set to storm the island. Panic-stricken, in spite of Caesar's encouragement, many of his men then fled their posts, either by ship or jumping into the sea. Oh, no. Caesar attempted to retreat, but Port Eunostos' harbor was overrun with enemy ships, preventing escape. Reportedly, Caesar gathered his papers and leapt overboard in an attempt to swim to an allied ship farther out. 
Historian Cassius Dio claimed that Caesar would have drowned if he hadn't been able to remove his purple garment. Still, he managed to swim the distance and survive. The Alexandrians recovered the cloak and used it as a trophy to commemorate the Roman debacle. Oh, wow. Okay. War is crazy out here. Unhappy with Ganymedes and wanting their king restored, the Alexandrians approached Caesar with a compromise. Caesar agreed to release Ptolemy the 13th after entreating him to spare the kingdom and remain loyal to Rome. Once freed, however, the king defied the agreement and continued the war. Ooh, evil, evil. That's what's up. Always stay five moves ahead. By this time, a faithful ally of Caesar's, Mithridates, arrived in Egypt, clashing with Ptolemy's troops at Pelusium. Outnumbering the enemy, Mithridates secured the region between Pelusium and Alexandria. Ptolemy, warned of Caesar's ally marching on Alexandria, sent his troops to prevent passage over the river. Mithridates warned Caesar in time, and the two groups confronted the armies of Ptolemy in the delta. Ooh. Okay. In the Battle of the Nile, the Romans gained the upper hand, sending the Egyptians fleeing. In the tumult and panic, King Ptolemy the Thirteenth drowned in the Nile. It's a lot of drowning going on. After the siege ended, Cleopatra the Seventh married her younger brother, Ptolemy the Fourteenth, enabling her to reign over Egypt until 30 BCE. Under her rule, Alexandria settled into its position within the Roman Empire and eventually surpassed Athens as one of the most important cities in the Roman Empire. Oh, no way. Julius Caesar remained in Egypt for a short time. He and Cleopatra would later have a son named Caesarion. Huh. I wonder if that has anything to do with, like, Caesarion section? Or maybe not. I don't know. I wonder the origins of uh, the etymology of words. Okay, I think we'll do one last one, um, and then we'll call it a day for now. This is pretty cool. I I like the I like the uh, life ones much more than the uh, architect ones. If you want to see the pyramid one, go check it out by picking up the game. I'm not into that stuff. It's fascinating finding out why people do what they do. Harlot Queen. Oh, that's cool. More years between the pyramid construction and Cleopatra's time and Cleopatra to us. Meaning history is much older than we know. Welcome to Introduction to Alexandria. Alexander the Great's city. After conquering Egypt in 331 BCE, Alexander the Great decided to build a new city, which, as per his habit, he named after himself. After his death, Alexandria quickly became the capital city of the Ptolemaic Kingdom and the most important city of the Greek world. The city was built between the Mediterranean Sea and Lake Mariotis, which resulted in Alexandria becoming a crucial cultural hub and trading center. Sumptuous buildings could be seen wherever one turned their gaze. The royal palaces, the many temples, the gymnasium, lush public gardens, and large avenues. That's cool. With its incomparable beauty and advantageous geographic location, Alexandria attracted foreigners, intellectuals, and traders. One of the most cosmopolitan cities of the ancient world, Alexandria supplanted even Athens as the most important Greek city in history. Ooh, Alexandria being of Athens. Egyptian obelisks were highly prized by Roman architects. 
While Roman design previously favored the use of a single monument, Egyptian obelisks tended to come in pairs and were generally located at the entrance of temples. Several ancient Egyptian obelisks are still in existence today, though many are spread out across the world in locations such as Paris, Rome, New York, and London. Oh, really? All of this shows that Alexandria was significantly influenced by the rich past of Egypt. Okay, built from what you know. Alexandria had several main streets. Its most famous artery was the Canopic Way. It was lined with sumptuous buildings, houses, and temples, and was roughly eight kilometers in length. Oh, wow. It's pretty far. This street was one of the most important shipping entrances to Alexandria, and often hosted processions and festivals. I like how he keeps using the word, uh, scrum scrumptious. The width of the street, 30 meters, was abnormally large even by Greek standards. This is likely because the Canopic Way was made in a short span of time and based on an urban plan, as opposed to being slowly built over time, as was usual for the era. Oh, I see. So, like, they... One of the first premeditated pre locations. The Canopic Way originated in the Western cemeteries, skirted the gymnasium, and then exited the city to head east through massive doorways towards Canopus. This structure was known as the Canopic Door. It all makes sense. Canopus, Canopic. I like how uh, what, you, what you'll begin to find out is all these like fancy words are built off the explanation of uh, the thing. So it's like, why'd you call it Canopic Way? Well, it's like, can of, can of, can of here? What, what do you say? Whatever that was, uh, it led to that location. It's like, it'd be obvious to just call it that, you know? Um, but yeah. Uh, I guess we will end it here. This was another fascinating one. Um, pyramids not so fascinating, but life during the time is. So, till next time, stay educated. Thank you. Take care.